Imagine trekking by yourself 4,000 kilometers across the Canadian Arctic, by canoe, by foot, on ice floes. For most of us, inconceivable. For Adam Schultz, it was the adventure of a lifetime. He tells it in thrilling detail in his most recent book. It's called Beyond the Trees, A Journey Alone Across Canada's Arctic. Adam Schultz is explorer in residence at the Royal Canadian Geographical Society, and he joins us now for more. It's great to meet you. Oh, thanks for having me on the we show. We should say, we had your Uncle Dave on the show not too long ago. Oh, well, that's nice of you to do. David Schultz, the sports writer, just in case people recognize that last name. Okay, can I do this off the top? Fair warning. A lot of my questions to you today are going to be a variation on the theme of, are you crazy? And this is not going to be new for you, right? Because you've had a lot of people ask you over the years whether you're crazy to embark on something like this. So why don't we just start there? Adam, are you crazy to undertake a voyage like this? Well, I don't think so. I, <laughs> I think it was a lot of fun, but uh, I know that it can seem dangerous when you're reading my book or you're looking at some of the photographs in the book and I'm in the middle of ice flows in my, my little canoe. But I, as I try to explain the book, everything I'm doing, I'm trying to be as cautious as or as cautious as possible, and I'm, you know, carefully plotting out my every move uh, when I'm in al alone in the wilderness. Yeah, and there's no reason to think that when a bear lunges at you or when muskox take a run at you, there's no reason to assume that you're in any danger in those circumstances. Well, you know, I try to read the animal's behavior and, and give them uh, their space and try to give them a wide berth if I'm able. Uh, and you were able, thankfully, which is why you're here today. Can we show a bit of uh, the trailer for the documentary that you put together on this as well? Because sure. you, 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 did, you did a lot of this on camera as well. So, Sheldon, if you would, a clip, please. My goodness, spectacular. And now from the book. In total, including the doubling back I'd have to do on all the portages, it worked out to a distance of almost 4,000 kilometers. That is nearly 4,000 kilometers across the largest expanse of wilderness, free of roads and cities, yet remaining in the terrestrial world outside of Antarctica. Okay, obvious question off the top. Why do this? Well, as that uh, excerpt from my book just said, I mean, I think that the that being the largest terrestrial world left in the, or wilderness left in the world, it makes it extremely special. I mean, it's a real gem that Canadians have in our own backyard. And uh, how much longer is it gonna remain like that before there are roads parceling it up? Could be any year, right? Every year the wilderness shrinks a little more around the world. So I figured you only, you only live once, I might as well give it my best shot while I still can. So I decided I'm just gonna head east and see how far I get. Adam, you only live once, but you only die once too. And <laughs> and did you worry that at some point you might not make it? No, not really. I mean, I just tried to take it one day at a time, put one step in front of the other, and slow and steady wins the race. That was kind of my mantra. Has anybody ever undertaken anything like this alone before? Well, there's been, you know, many great solo journeys all over the world. There was a- uh, No, no, I mean here, in our, in our Canadian North, in the Northern Arctic in the way that you did it. Anybody done this before? Well, there's a, not, not exactly like this because there's, a, there's an infinite number of routes you could come up with, but there's certainly uh, predecessors I would tip my hat off. Uh, Jerry Kobolenko was a great, is a great uh, solo explorer from Alberta and he's done many solo expeditions in the Canadian high Arctic. Hmm. Um, but that's a different, I mean, he does mostly cross country skiing, but yeah, there's definitely precedents for doing um, solo wilderness travel of the sort that I do. You mentioned there's a thousand different routes to take. Is there an obvious route, though, one would take if one were going to do this? Well, no, there's no obvious route. I mean, if you look at the map of northern Canada and you're trying to go from west to east or east to west, there's a little bit of a problem, and that's most of the waterways that don't the, flow. Yeah, there's the map right there. Why don't you just sort of give us a sense about what you're... So the, the you're starting, You started up in the northwest. Yes, I started in the mountains of the northern Yukon because I figured the ice breakup in the west is sooner than in the east, and the east 
Hudson Bay kind of freezes everything um, right up until July. So I started in the west so I could get my canoe in the water sooner. And then I just went east from there, starting along the Arctic Circle. And you started in what month? I started in May. So that you would at least have some summer and hopefully be finished before? Before the snow came in September. So mm -hmm. it was a race against the seasons, uh, just going east as fast as I could go. And how long did it take, the whole thing? It took about four months. Four months up there on your own? Yep. For 95% for of it, 99% of it, actually. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, because you did run, run into a few people along the way. D does GPS work up there? Oh, yes. GPS will work anywhere where you have a satellite uplink. Okay, but a regular cell phone, I mean, you couldn't get signal for that kind of thing, presumably. No, there is, ordinary cell phones won't work because you need a cell tower, and you could be 1,000 kilometers from the nearest right. cell tower. And even, even in the 21st century, there are some limitations to GPS. The maps aren't foolproof. You can still have errors on a map. So how do you signal to people who would care that you're okay. I can see you're very concerned about me. All your questions are <laughs> trending in this, I'm in danger, and it's, it's very touching that you have this, this concern for me, Steve. Uh, so, well, what I would do is, uh, through the satellite, uh, of course, I have to ration the batteries on my device, but at night when I would make my camp and I would crawl inside after eating a freeze-dried meal, uh, I could actually send through the satellite a little um, message with my latitude and my longitude, my coordinates. Got it. And if I fell in a river and the satellite device was swept away and then several days went by, uh, you know, my family might have wondered, well, where did, what happened to him? And then it would be up to them if they decided to just think that maybe he dropped his satellite and he's fine or if they wanted to uh, take action from there. How old are you? I'm 33. Okay, so you're not much older than my oldest kid, which may explain why I have such a paternal concern about your safety <laughs> here. But anyway, next question. Why do it alone? Well, my first solo trip was when I was only 13, and I was, uh, that was the first time I ever went alone in the wilderness. I'd done camping trips for before that, you know, from when I was old enough to walk. I loved the outdoors. I loved the forest. I loved nature. Uh, that was the air I breathed. Uh, but I was 13, and I was staying with an uncle, a different uncle, not Uncle David, and... Uh, uh, my uncle let me go out into the woods for a weekend by myself. And I remember, you know, that first night as a 13-year-old in the backwoods of, of northern Ontario, I, I didn't sleep a wink. I thought a black bear was going to come and devour me. Um, so I was a little bit worried. I just stayed under this big willow tree. But the sun rose in the morning, and I survived my night, and I was kind of hooked. And I've been doing solo travel ever since. And, you know, I still do expeditions every year with other people, and there's certainly advantages to traveling with a partner. You have the camaraderie of other people in the wilderness, and that can be fun and enjoyable. And it's, it's certainly easier uh, if you're battling big headwinds on a, a vast lake. You have two people paddling together. But there's something about solo travel that I really enjoy as well, like the freedom and simplicity of just wandering in the wilderness alone. There's something very, uh, very rewarding about that, I find. You just mentioned bears, so let me ask you about this, because you do deal with this early in the book, and it happened more than once, where you found yourself, all right, let's start with the Yukon, Dempster Road, some bear saw you. Yeah, I probably crossed paths with about 14 or 15 bears on the entire trek. And if I were to tally up all my journeys, I've probably crossed paths with many hundreds of bears. And I knew that would happen inevitably. I think it happened within like three hours of my trek mm -hmm. on day one. I had a grizzly uh, come out of the mountains and growl at me and even charge towards me. But I know the odds. You know, the odds are uh, most bears in the Arctic, grizzlies especially, are known for their bluff charges where they just want to see if they can spook you. And if you stand your ground and you don't flinch, the odds are they're going to run away. So that's what I tried to do. You did that. You got up as high as you could. You waved your poles at him. Yeah, exactly. And, and the bear turned around. He did. Okay, good thing. Yeah. Which is, again, why you're sitting here today. The odds are on your side if you just stand your ground. So You did have bear spray, though, right? Yes, I did. And did you ever have to use it? Well, the thing about bear spray is it doesn't work all the time. Because if the wind isn't blowing just right, you can't possibly use it unless you just want to add flavor to yourself. So... Uh, especially in the Arctic on the tundra or in the mountains, it's, it's often windy. And it's a real hazard if you're going to whip out bear spray because the bear can change directions. And if he comes uh, from the other way and you pull your, you, you use your bear spray, that pepper spray might just come right back in your face and then you're going to be on down on the ground. So I try to avoid using it. And in fact, I've never used bear spray on any of my trips. I carry it, but I've never, I've always avoided using it, even when I have a bear close to me growling. Hmm. Okay, a ferry operator named Morris greeted you when you arrived at the Mackenzie River, which is, what's that? That's our biggest river in the whole country, right? Yes, Mackenzie? absolutely, okay. 13th longest in the world. He had been briefed on your paddle, on your, pa on your plan, rather, to paddle 
up the river. Yes. In other words, against the current. Yes. Okay, here's what you wrote in the book. When Morris saw me arrive, somewhat wearied from my hike, he looked me up and down and asked, what kinds of drugs are you smoking? None, I assured him. So you're just crazy then. Uh, that was his reaction, uh, Adam. That was my reaction for a lot of this as well. Um, <laughs> later on in your dash across the Arctic, you encountered a canoeist on the Coppermine River, and her response to hearing about your plan was similar. Wow, that's kind of impressive, she said, but also kind of insane. Yes. So I'm not the only person who sort of has this um, concern about your sanity. Oh, well, I know. If I'm being audience, honest, before I left and I was planning my route, I knew it was inevitable if I was going to get from the west to the east, I would have to travel upstream against the current on many different rivers, many powerful rivers. And I think in total, when I worked it out, it was about 1,200 kilometers of upstream travel. So that's me paddling alone against the current on some pretty powerful rivers like the Coppermine and the Mackenzie. And when I discussed uh, this beforehand with fellow canoeists who were acquainted with these northern rivers, they said that that's insane and impossible. And, and you figured out a way to do it, though. Well, I just went to the history books, and I thought, and I brainstormed, and I knew that, you know, going against a river that powerful, brawn is going to count for very little. It doesn't matter how many weights you lift. You're not going to be strong enough to get up a river like that. You just can't paddle. That's not going to work. So I knew I had to figure out some other strategy. Which was? Well, I settled upon poling, which is kind of a lost art. It's the sort of thing that was done hundreds of years ago, but has kind of been forgotten about today. But if you can cut down a pole of about 10 or 11 feet in length and stay in close to the bank, you can use that pole to reach the river bottom. And if you can maintain your balance in the canoe uh, standing upright, then you can actually pull off the bottom and push yourself upstream against the current. Now, Adam, I was taught as a kid, you never, ever stand up in a canoe. But clearly, I was taught wrong because you did it, and you did it successfully. Did well, you ever fall in? No, I never fell in, but that is one of the golden rules they teach in canoe school is that don't stand up in the boat. But yeah. sometimes you have to if you want to get to where places I go. Uh, you don't have a choice, so you just take it one step at a time. And you managed to pull your way. How many kilometers do you estimate in total? Well, it was about 1,200 kilometers upriver travel, but not all that was pulling. There were okay. places where the current would slacken, mm -hmm. and then I would use my paddle. There were other places where it was so strong that I couldn't even pull or it was too deep, and then I'd have to go on shore and and actually hike along the shore and use a rope to guide my canoe down below or even grab onto the bow and, and pull it along the bank. So, mm. I must say I loved your reaction when you encountered an animal that is truly, I mean, it really does look like something from a million years ago. Sheldon, you want to bring this graphic up right now? We're going to show a picture of a, is that a musk ox? Is that what you call that? Absolutely. Describe that for us, if you would, because we've got some people listening on podcast who can't see it. Well, it's one of my favorite animals, and they do, as you say, look like they're from the Ice Age, like these prehistoric half-ton creatures, kind of like an Arctic bison. They have the shape of a bison, and they have uh, very impressive curved horns, as you can see in this photograph of one I took uh, right outside my tent. He woke me up in the middle of the night How there. far away are you from that right at, at oh, that I'm moment? I'm only about five feet or so. I don't have any fancy camera like a, a Canon or a hmm. Nikon with a zoom or anything. Um, so he's just outside my tent there. and. One of the most impressive aspects of, of the musk ox is the, the shield on their forehead. That's a, a big mass of bone right on the forehead there, and that's because the males will actually uh, gallop into each other and charge each other head on. So they have this almost like armor on their forehead there, as you can see in the photograph. So they're very, uh, very impressive animals. Were you ever in danger when that was five feet away from you? Well, I always thought of them as gentle giants because I'd done previous canoe trips in the Arctic and uh, cross paths with probably a hundred of them. And most of them are just gentle giants. They just want to graze on willows on the tundra and they don't really pay any attention to humans. And that was for the most part on my journey, except there were a couple that woke me up in the night and they started snorting. And uh, those ones did give me a, a little bit of a sweaty palm moment and they were a little more aggressive. So, uh, you know, 99 might be friendly and gentle, but then it's the one out of the hundred you have to look out for. Hmm. Uh, from the Mackenzie, you wanted to make your way to Great Bear Lake, which is, that's what the, like, uh, it's one of the biggest lakes in the whole world. Eighth largest. Eighth yeah. largest lake in the world. You opted not to take an easier route, which was an option. You took a harder route. Yes. The Hare Indian River. Yes. Why? Well, there were two reasons why. So I could have kept going up the Mackenzie River all the way to the uh, Great Bear River, mm -hmm. which connects directly to the lake. I mean, it's the outlet from Great Bear. So that's the traditional travel route that would have been used for centuries. Uh, but I decided not to go that way for a couple of reasons. One, in keeping with the spirit of my journey, I wanted to stay in the Arctic, stay in the north along the Arctic Circle as much as I could. 
And uh, two, I like, the, I like the allure of the unknown route, the harder one. I mean, I didn't know if it was possible, but I figured um, it'll be, certainly be interesting to try. So I figured I'm going to go up this river and see where it takes me. And if I can get there, uh, that'll be good. So I'm just going to give it my best shot, and we'll see where this takes me. When you got to Great Bear Lake, which they named because you did see some great bears there, did you not? Oh, yes. Yeah, you did. You wrote, now more than ever, I could feel the solitude of my journey. And I guess we all really want to know what it's like to be so far away from your normal life for such a long period of time without seeing another human often, well, for days and days and days and days on end. Well, for me, what it really Im impresses upon you is um, the majesty of nature. I mean, I, I love the natural world. And I think nowadays, a lot of people, we're just so busy. We're always on our phones. We're always on our computers. We're in traffic. Uh, we're in the city that we don't get the chance to just step out and appreciate the natural world and all its majesty. I mean, uh, just think of seeing the stars and how difficult that is in Toronto. I mean, with the, the urban glow, you just can't do you can't. it. Yeah. And uh, why I wrote that specifically about that passage is it, when I came to Great Bear, it was just a vast expanse. I mean, water uh, to the horizon. So, you know, this vast landscape in all directions and no human-made objects on it uh, really impressed upon me. Uh, the majesty of the north, its vastness, and the solitude. You're alone a lot, but were you ever lonely? Well, not really lonely as, you, as much as you might think, because I love animals, and I had the company of uh, many different species of birds, of uh, all different types of wildlife. I might see a fox outside my tent. I might see an arctic ground squirrel, a caribou, a moose. Uh, wolves were often very curious about me. There was a few times where I found myself looking, in my, looking an arctic wolf in the eyes. Uh, some of the Arctic wolves, they even followed me. There was one in, there was a picture of one in the book I took. That wolf followed me for about a kilometer and a half. There he is. Oh, yeah, that's him. Uh, so they were often very curious about me, and they would come and see me. And I think that was one of the rewards of traveling solo. Uh, if I had been in a group of eight paddlers, which is often the case on northern trips, you know, you have a group of eight or ten people, the animals are a little bit more shy, a little more wary of human presence. But if you're by yourself and you're quiet, uh, many of these animals, like wolves, will come up to you and look at you. So that was one of the delights and the rewards of, of traveling solo. I should ask you again about one of your reactions to, to actually seeing people. Because there was a moment in the trip where five female explorers came upon you. Yes. And the reaction you write about in the book is, I couldn't wait for them to leave because <laughs> I wanted my solitude back. Well, that is an unusual reaction for a guy who's outdoors by himself for four months in the Arctic. Can I say that? Well, it's the, the socializing can be overwhelming. It can be exhausting, uh, the mental effort of, of, of socializing. And so I just kind of wanted to get back to the simplicity of, of trying to get my canoe up river. And, you know, just navigating through ice flows or portaging between lakes. Everything was very simple. It's just put one foot in front of the other and, and deal with the task at hand. So Similarly, you found another guy, a very rich guy who had this cabin in the middle of nowhere. He offered to let you come have lunch with him, give you a shower, which you probably hadn't had in several weeks at that point, and you turned him down. You said, no thanks. Yes. How come? Well, there was a couple of reasons why. One, I was just being practical. The weather was good. The wind was favorable, so I didn't want to do a detour. I wanted to take advantage of the calm conditions and paddle as hard as I could. And I was also a little bit, well, I was a little bit shy after months alone. I didn't really want to socialize. It was a little bit intimidating. Um, I'd rather be, you know, out on the tundra. Uh, but also, I, I thought that if I went inside his compound and he gave me orange juice, then it, it might be harder to continue my journey. You know, I was in the zone, mm. and I was used to my routine, and I didn't want to deviate from my routine and have anything from the outside, so I just kept going. Too much comfort could deviate from the routine. Well, you get into the zone, right? right. Well, after a few weeks, you get into the routine, the groove, and then if you stop and you sleep in a bed and you have a hot meal and you have orange juice, then it can be harder uh, to continue beyond that point. Gotcha. Where's the Coppermine River? Coppermine is almost right in the Central Arctic, uh, in the Northwest Territories and Nunavut. It kind of weaves across the, the artificial boundary between them, and then it drains right down into the Northwest Passage. Here's what you wrote about that part of your trip. No aspect of my journey across the Arctic was more fraught with danger, uncertainty, and hardship than what this storied river promised to unleash upon me. Somehow, against all conventional logic, I had to find a way to canoe the Coppermine River in reverse, a river whose current made the Mackenzies tame in comparison. Its formidable roaring current 
packed as it was with thunderous whitewater rapids, treacherous cliffs, and deep canyons I knew would take everything I had. Any close calls there? Oh yeah, there were a few. I mean, that was definitely the part of my journey that filled me with the most doubt. Uh, I mean, I figured I'm gonna have to get up the Mackenzie because if I can't get up that river, I'll have no chance whatsoever on the copper mine because uh, that river is just so powerful. And that was the one that most canoeists uh, laughed at when they said, you'll never in a million years get up that alone. But I just figured, you know, if the current is rip roaring and just racing along, uh, my only choice is to take this one step at a time. You know, step by step, inch by inch, I will get up this river. Uh, it's going to take patience, but I just kept thinking of the old, you know, childhood story you learn, uh, the tortoise and the hare. I'm going to be the tortoise and I'm going to go slow. And step by step, I'll, I'll work my way up this river against the current, which is what I did. Slow and steady wins the race. It really does. 4,000 kilometer journey. You wrote this with only eight kilometers to go. You set up a camp and here's what you wrote. It was with a strange pang of sadness that I set up my tent on the tundra for the last time. I'd come so far, and despite the hardships, had so loved the journey. The routine, the wildlife, the plants and rocks, the landscapes, the wildness, the glorious skies, even the storms a little, that a part of me didn't want to end it. No stormy, icy lake I'd ever crossed, roaring, massive river I'd pulled up, ice flows I'd pushed on through, or pathless portage over chaotic rocks seemed half so daunting and demoralizing as the thought of what my email inbox might look like upon my return. That's beautifully written, but tell me, what, what are the sentiments that you're trying to get at there? Well, it's just the simplicity of, of uh, having a task where all you do is paddle and I have to get to you as far as I can in a day paddling. And I love, I love doing that and I love the routine of my journey you know, every night, no matter how exhausted I was, I'd force myself in my tent to uh, write some notes in my journal and note all the birds I'd seen that day. So I might say, you know, a common merganser and uh, uh, a yellow warbler and a peregrine falcon and a bald eagle. And I would write down the birds I'd seen. And it was always a thrill if I got a new one that I hadn't seen before. So I love that kind of thing. And I love just the, the ease and simplicity of, of just traveling east every day. And uh, I didn't, you know, part of me didn't want it to end. I mean, there was a part of me that was looking forward to having a shower and eating some yogurt or something like that and, you know, maybe getting to sit on a couch. But you know, there was a part of me that really didn't want it to end because of all the things I loved about my journey. I was going to ask you, the first time you used a smartphone or the first time that you flipped on a TV set to watch a show, the first time you're sort of quote unquote back in civilization. Yes. How odd did that feel? Well, it felt, it would have been harder if I had to stay in a big city, um, but I was only in transit through Toronto. So if I could get to the green space on my doorstep, I lived in Sudbury at that time, then that's my, my sanity is restored. And that, that to me is one thing I hope people take away from their, the book. If you're stressed out about life, uh, you don't have to spend four months crossing the Arctic. I think anyone could benefit just from un unplugging a little bit, even if it's 20 minutes a day and just going to a, a local park or anywhere you can get in the outside in trees. I feel like it really does have this, this calming effect on it, I mean, uh, on us. And, and that's what I had to do when I got home. You know, I went right back out into the woods and I made sure that every day I was out in the woods for at least a little bit doing a hike and that made the transition uh, a lot easier. So I think that's the key. You have to make time uh, to be in the outdoors every day. At least I try to. I do need to ask you one last thing, and that is about, of course, climate change. How concerned are you that what you saw will never be the same in the future because of the impacts of climate change on our far north? Well, I'm tremendously concerned, not just about climate change, but about all of the environmental issues, because sometimes climate change can kind of monopolize it, and we forget about all the other, like habitat loss and loss of biodiversity that isn't directly connected to that, but all the other things that are a part of it. But I mean, to me, environmental issues are the most important of all issues. Before I ever wrote a book, I just wrote on environmental topics for my local hometown newspaper. It was called Reflections of a Naturalist. And I wrote about all these issues for many years. And you know, I thought when I was on the fence beforehand, whether or not I risked this journey, I thought you know, that's really why I should do it because I have a chance here to, to see the North in a relatively untouched state as it exists in 2017 and, and try my best to record it as I saw it because uh, who knows how much longer it's going to stay in that state? What's it going to look like in another 150 years? We don't know. I mean, I hope we find the will to preserve it and, and save nature while it's still possible. 
uh, but I didn't know, so I wanted to write the book to leave a record of, of what it looked like in my eyes, and hopefully when people read the book, if I can inspire them, this is a little bit to look at wild nature with fresh eyes and a fresh perspective, uh, then maybe the journey wouldn't have, won't have been in vain. Whoever reads this book will feel that impact because it is a really, it is a thrilling accounting of uh, what was undoubtedly uh, the trip of a lifetime for you. And um, I'm glad you're back safe and sound. Well, thank you. <laughs> Beyond the Trees, A Journey Alone Across Canada's Arctic. That's Adam Schultz. Thanks a lot, Adam. Oh, my pleasure. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.